You're listening to the Bethel Community Church Podcast. Our podcast normally showcases our weekly sermons here in Chicago at 7601 West Foster. Now, podcasts are great, but they do not replace the care and community you receive from the local church or from your local pastor. So we encourage you to come join our community or contact us to help you find a community in your area. We pray the Lord speaks to you as you listen. Enjoy. My name is Mike Greenwood. I am your director of groups here at Bethel. And if you're new here today, I'd love for you to fill one of those forms out so we can get to know you. Um, If it's your first time visiting us, we'd love you to come down to the front after service or go to our Connect Center out in the hallway there, down the hall that way. Uh, We want to be a community that gets to know each other. Uh, Bethel kids, by the way, yeah, you're dismissed. My apologies. We forget that every week. We love you guys. Have fun. Um, Before we jump into the message this week, I want to take a moment this week, and for all of you who were here last week, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for sending out Mark and Sarah, Nora, James, and Gabe, sending them out to the next chapter of their life. Uh, Truly, that is what it is to be a loving family here in our church. We just finished a series on following, following Jesus, and I want to remind us that we have this new commandment to the church to love one another, and that's how... The world will know that we're his. So thank you for loving on them. That commandment applies to our passage this week. So as we open up our message this morning, take a moment to look around the room and take inventory of who's here. I never take for granted the relationships we have here. Some of them are new relationships. Some of them are old. um, But we're praying as we move forward as a church that we grow together in Christ and grow together as a family. So I'm going to do that church thing. I'm going to ask you guys to take a moment to say welcome and hello to each other. There we go. See, we're a church that does that well. I knew I was opening myself up for a longer welcome. Um, We're opening up a new series in Philippians. It's a short series in Philippians, and we can make this. This could be a really long study, but based on our calendar, we're making kind of a mini-series, which means there's a lot of ground to cover in our messages. And we kind of looked at this series. There's a lot for our church to glean from this letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. It's a letter that can meet our needs right here in our body. So you can open up your Bible. If you're in a pew Bible, it's uh, page 980 to Philippians. We're going to do a brief overview of the book. We're going to start chapter 1, verse 27 for the message this morning, but we're going to look at the book really quickly and take a brief look at the context of the letter before we get into it. If you look at uh, the opening of the letter, you see that it's from Paul and Timothy's with him. We know these are strong characters in the early church on Paul's missionary journey. Paul's in Rome. He's in prison for the gospel. He's in Rome where he wanted to be, but he's there in prison now. The book of Acts, chapter 15, verses 36 through about 1640, will give us the information on Paul's missionary journey. And what we find out is a little bit of the context of that church, but we don't have a lot of information about how that church was founded. But we can infer a lot from the text there. It's the occasion of this letter that stands out to me as unique in Paul's writing. Paul opens up this letter. It's a mostly positive letter. He's sharing his thankfulness with that church. These are people who support him, and he considers them partners in the gospel. The letter appears, again, to be thanksgiving, encouragement, and then there's some warnings there. But what we're going to see is a lot of these warnings are for outside influences to the church, and that matters. We're going to compare that this morning. We're going to compare the Philippian church to Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And we're going to see that the tone and the content of that letter is much different. See, the Corinthian church had problems, but those were problems from within. And we're going to see that the Philippian church, we know they're not perfect people. It's a church made of people, and there's always things going on, but they seem to be getting some of this stuff right. So in chapter 1, we're going to open up, Paul shares an update and encouragement about himself. And what we see there is Paul is in chains for the gospel. And what he's telling the church is that even in his suffering, 
the gospel is moving forward, even amongst the guards that are watching him. So Paul is showing that church who he's partners with that God is glorified even in the suffering that Paul is walking through. And that kind of gets us up to the passage today. Now, there's more context that we can address as we cover it in the passage, but we're going to read through uh, verse 27 through a little bit of chapter 2. So you can put your finger on verse 27 and follow along. Paul says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engage in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Bow your heads as we pray over that. Uh, Father God, You are an awesome God. Your word is good. Uh, There is so much in this short passage, so much to learn about who you are, so much to learn about what you'd have for us. So we pray that you keep us free from error this morning. Pray that we are uh, seeing a message that you would have for us, that you plant seeds in our hearts that would grow uh, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul opens up this section of scripture here, and we see the first thing that I see in the language there is that Paul is telling the church that their life should reflect their faith. So for us, our life should reflect our faith. Paul opens up in verse 27. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And what we need to understand here, and you might see it in the footnotes of your Bible, is that Paul is playing on words here. And that playing on words leads us to another context that we have to cover. And that's the people of Philippi, the church that was there. If you look in Acts, you see that Paul shows up and there's not enough men for a synagogue. And he sees the women by the, by the water What we know about that area, though, is that it's a proud Roman Gentile culture. And that's what Paul is using. He's using words that would be familiar to them. It's a unique coastal city far away from Israel. I have a little map that you could see. It's along the coastal conduit of the empire. This is where people travel. You can see that Israel is all the way down there on the far right. Rome, where Paul's at, is all the way on the left at the top of the boot. And there's Philippi, this very unique Roman city. In Paul's day, this city itself was already an old and ancient city. It was established as a Roman colony because of the wars that happened there. And the people that were left were the victors, right? And these are Roman citizens, and they're a significant population of retired military people, the victors of war who have a strong affection for their government. These people identified with Rome. So I'm trying to look at what Paul's, in Paul's time, what this looked like. We study our Bibles. We look at the New Testament. We see all this stuff from a Jewish perspective. Rome are the occupying oppressors. That's the context when they preached in Israel. Paul's preaching to Gentiles here where there's a nationalism for Rome. There's a loyalty to Rome. That's a different context, and we should know that. When thinking about this loyalty, I'm thinking about our day and how that kind of applies. And it's really easy to try to jump the politics But really, our politics, unless you're on social media, are pretty hard to see. Um, 
I took a step back and I was trying to think of other loyalties that we can see. And I think about the area of Chicago and we can see, you go downtown, other neighborhoods around the sports venues, and we can see that Chicago flag everywhere. We can see it on mugs, tattoos, t-shirts, coffee cups. If you're a suburbanite and you say you're from Chicago, someone might bite your head off. There's flag merch everywhere. Tourists come to get it. There's a loyalty for some that are in the city. Others of us are a little confused at the pride there. You can go a step back and you could drive north on the 94 to an unnamed state and you'll see a similar loyalty where the gas stations and things start becoming gold and green. It gets weirder the farther north you get. <laughs> we have group identities, all right? So this is something we need to recognize. That's Philippi. It's a place of Roman pride. People with familiarity of the rank and file of the military. And Paul is saying to them, like, be good citizens in a way that they would understand, like, being a good Roman citizen. But that's the catch in the passage, right, when he opens up. He's saying to his Roman brothers and sisters, he's saying, hey, church, be worthy citizens of God's kingdom. So your identity is the Jesus first. Does your life reflect that? Are you a Roman, a proud Roman, or are you a Christian, a follower of Christ? And Paul is saying in this passage, if I come or if I don't come, is your reputation going to represent your true citizenship? So for us in the church today, I challenge us, do our coworkers, our neighbors know more about our sports affiliation, our profession, or our politics than our true citizenship? This is what Paul is getting at as he opens this up. So as Paul says to this church, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Are you a good citizen of the kingdom? When he starts to explain that, he says that the desire of the church that he has is that we be unified, one spirit and one mind. Unity, Paul says, one spirit, one mind for the faith of the gospel. It's unity with a purpose. And you'll notice that one spirit, it's the little S in the Bible. You know, the capital S of the Holy Spirit will come later in the passage. But Paul is speaking to the relationships here within the church. You can see the church and Paul, they're partners. They support each other. That's part of the context of this letter. He's telling the church, to the elders of that church, the deacons and all the people of that church, are you all partners for the gospel? It may not be a perfect analogy, but when I think of one spirit, one mind, I kind of think of the idea of being unified, like philosophically agreeing about our goal, what we're here for. To be unified in mind then would possibly be to say, how do we get to that goal? And that's where this can be really hard, agreeing on how we get there. We'll talk, of that, we'll talk a little more about that in a bit. But the biggest part of that is being unified about that very goal. And in this message, Paul is talking about moving the message of Jesus, the good news of the gospel, forward, that God's will is done. And we'll talk about that some. But Paul expands on the effects of this unity in verse 28. He tells the church that we need not be frightened by our opponents. If we're unified around the truth and the simple, profound truth of the gospel, that's going to matter a lot. You see that right now, the opponents in this passage, the hard part is we don't know who they are necessarily. We can gather that they're probably the Judaizers, those who bring a false and oppressive gospel in. Or maybe it's the pagans, like we saw in Acts, who reject the truth claims of Jesus. But Paul says our unity brings about a clear sign of their destruction. So if we're united about that simple and profound truth, that's pretty damning to anyone who'd add to it or change it. But Paul's writing an encouraging letter here, and he's trying to say if we're unified around that gospel, we should have affirmation of our salvation, confirmation of our salvation, that God alone gets the glory. And so we should discuss the gospel. What is that? It's that God the Father sent his Son to die for us, broken sinners who were separated from him. We cannot save ourselves. It was even granted to us that we would believe, he says. The Lord has chosen us as a people, and we don't know why. He's also chosen us as a church, flawed as we are, to move his good news forward. And we can put our faith in that gospel message today, and we can be part of that mission. He desires for us to be unified in that. So in our passage, there's that repeated word again, one mind, one spirit. And I want to compare that with 1 Corinthians, and it'll be on the screen for you. I'll read it. But a key passage in 1 Corinthians is about disunity. Chapter 1, verse 10 says, this is Paul to that church. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. 
What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And in verse 13, Paul asks that question, is Christ divided? And we know the answer is no. And Paul, in that letter, is addressing internal issues of that church, infighting in that church. In our passage, we see that repetition again of same mind, one mind. This is what we are called to as a church and as individuals. And we can see that quarreling in our church, in our body, is a no-no. That's the only way I could see it. And Paul is saying that our life should reflect our faith and that we are to be united in the gospel. So we should ask the question, what else makes up being that same mind? How do we do it? How do we strive and maintain unity in our body? And from our passage, we see that this unity begins with humility. In chapter 2, Paul points this out. And he says when the church get this, gets this right, it brings him joy. And he says in verse 3 of chapter 2, and this is that hard passage for us, do nothing, for, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Count others more significant than ourselves. And Paul says, have this mind among us. And then he doubles down there. After he tells us that he doubles down and gives us an example, and he gives us an example of Jesus, Jesus in his humility, Jesus in his servanthood, and Jesus, in his obedience, to put God's will first. And then skimming right back over the end of that, verses 9 through 11, we see that this all matters, that Christ is glorified. We do all this, and Jesus is glorified through the unity in his church. All of this stuff sounds good, and when we read over it, we can nod our heads at it. But we should ask the question, how can we be a church that would bring Paul joy? How can we be a church that's unified around Jesus and unified around the gospel? How can we be a church that's one mind, one spirit, as we go about the mission of the gospel? How can we be a church that moves forward without looking at the past and being focused on that? Well, the challenges I have for us this morning, number one, is know our mission and know how you fit into it. It's on the wall outside in our foyer there. It's in your bulletins today. But our mission is to proclaim the truth of Jesus and grow mature disciples for the glory of God. These aren't just words. These are, this is what we seek to do week in and week out. And so as we know our mission, we should know how we fit into it. And once we start doing that, we start being of one mind. If you've been here for a while or you're new, we have a thing we're trying to describe this mission and how we do it. That's our discipleship pathway. You've heard the words, and maybe it's been confusing in the past. These aren't teams or programs of the church. They're just simply words that describe what we're trying to accomplish. The words are gather, grow, practice, and go. These are ongoing steps that we do every week. The staff meets this way. This is what we discuss. These are also words that we can apply to our own lives and our lives of those we're discipling. So I'll put some skin on those words so we understand that we're on the same page. To gather means we, we, we as a church, we meet, we meet. We meet as a body once with the desire that as many people come from our family here to get in this room and hear God's word preached and to worship together. That's how we gather. That's our number one thing that we do. We also want to grow. And to grow in our church the way we see it is to be connected in one of our small group ministries, primarily and preferentially our community groups. We also have other ministries that we can be plugged into where you're with smaller groups of people. And it's those smaller groups of people, our groups of our church, where we practice our faith and go out. We practice our faith and are accountable to each other. And we go out and serve and evangelize in our neighborhood because, as our mission statement says, we want to see God glorified. We want to see disciples made. That's the simple vision for Bethel Community Church. As we gather next week, we're going to have a new candidate here. I'm super excited. I've had a chance to meet him a number of times. I'm excited he's coming. I don't put my faith in a man who's coming here, but I do see a candidate who wants to unify us for the gospel. And I'm excited about that mission-oriented nature of that. Our second thing that we want to be challenged by this morning is heeding the warning and considering the value that we saw from 1 Corinthians that we read earlier. If you read 1 Corinthians, many of us are familiar with the language there. Paul charges that church that they're still drinking milk like infants, not getting to the meat of their faith. And because that's caused by strife and unity within the church. So the challenge for us is to consider the value of striving for unity within our body. We need to understand the eternal value of that unity. Remember the Great Commission says if we love each other, that's how the world knows we're his. 
We can think of all the problems Paul has to address in 1 Corinthians with that church. And when we see that, we can understand why he has joy as he's writing to the Philippian church. So we need to know the eternal value of walking as citizens of the kingdom. So as a church, what does that mean for us? We need to be hypersensitive to anything that would bring disunity in our body. If you avoid people in this congregation, if someone triggers you just simply by their presence in their room, if you're upset and have long-standing hurts, on your side of the equation, you have to act on that, pray on that, maybe seek help from someone else about that. We need to be sensitive. In chapter 1 of our passage, we kind of covered over it or glossed over it, but Paul was addressing people who would preach the gospel for their own motivations. We need to be sensitive for our motivations today. The challenge was to count others more highly than ourselves, and Paul gave us that ultimate example of Jesus. This is hard work. We have to learn ourselves. We have to do this in our own homes. It's a hard work to be unified in mission. We have to recognize when we raise our voice up or when we stop listening because someone wants to say something or when you find yourself saying, I want a lot. We need to be sensitive and self-aware of these things. We touched on this two weeks ago as we prayed through Luke and we talked about the Lord's Prayer and the idea of praying that the Lord would reveal sins in our lives that we aren't aware of. Similar sensitivity here. We have to pray over the desire for unity in our church. And if there's issues that we know we can address, that we pray about how we would address those. Because division in the church is the definition of not being on mission. And we want to proclaim the truth of Jesus and grow mature disciples for the glory of God here. As we approach next week, we have a lot of change coming in our church. There are new community groups starting. There's new pastor coming to take the helm. We brought Rebecca on staff. All these things, I'm excited to see the little changes that come. A new missions chairman soon. Uh, other meetings with leaders. Lots of things, lots of work for us to do as a church. So I pray this morning as we have all of these things that we face, that these are good works that God has laid out for us. I'm praying as a church we can grow and take hold of that unity that has a purpose of moving the gospel of Jesus Christ forward. So bow your heads with me. I'm going to invite Tommy back up. Father God, um, there's a lot packed in that passage, Lord, and we did go through it quite quickly. Lord, we pray for that call to unity, Lord, that not only are we unified in the church, but we're unified in working for you, knowing who you are, knowing the call that you have for us. Pray that we can be unified with our friends and, and co-workers here in the church and our families. Uh, all of this for the purpose of knowing that this unity is not something that's going to bring about your gospel work, Lord, that you want us to love each other. So pray that we can be a church that does go out. Pray that we could be a church that um, reaps the benefits of having a loving family, Lord. So we thank you for this body, and we thank you for uh, just who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.